Hello, word nerds. You're my friends. You're my only friends. Welcome to a new episode of the Dictionary podcast that you're listening to. First word for this episode is aphasia, A-P-H-A-S-I-A. It's a noun from 1864, loss or impairment of the power to use or comprehend words, usually resulting from brain damage. Aphasic is a noun or an adjective. That sounds like it sucks. I'm sorry if any of you have that. And that is especially bad in this case because if you are listening, uh, you are having trouble comprehending what I'm saying. And this podcast is all about words in addition to hearing words. So good luck to you. Next we have aphelion or aphelion, A-P-H-E-L-I-O-N. This is a noun from 1656, the point in the path of a celestial body as a planet that is farthest from the sun, compare to the word perihelion. This is from the Greek helios, it's uh, adding apo or apo at the beginning, and helios means sun, and there's more at the word solar. So if the aphelion is when the planet or uh, celestial body is the furthest away from the sun, perihelion is probably when it's the closest to the sun. Next we have aphoresis, and this is spelled similarly to the last word of the previous episode, aphoresis, uh, but in that case it had an A after the PH, and in this word, uh, aphoresis, we do not have the A. Uh, This is a noun from 1977, Withdrawal of blood from a donor's body, removal of one or more blood components as plasma, platelets, or white blood cells, and transfusion of the remaining blood back into the donor, called also pheresis. The next word is aphesis, A-P-H-E-S-I-S. So just to give you a little bit of pre-information, this is related to Apheresis, which means the loss of one or more sounds or letters at the beginning of a word, as in round for around. So the definition here for aphesis is apheresis consisting of the loss of a short, unaccented vowel, as in loan for alone. So they're clearly very related. Uh, in this case, they're getting rid of a vowel, uh, and with apheresis, Uh, It's getting rid of a sound. Uh, Usually it's probably a syllable, it looks like. Aphetic is an adjective, and aphetically is an adverb. Next we have aphid, A-P-H-I-D. It's a noun from 1827. Any of numerous very small soft-bodied homopterous insects that suck the juices of plants. What juices are in plants? Is it apple juice? Is it grape juice? Probably not either one of them. Uh, the homopterous insects, uh, in parentheses after that, it says superfamily aphidoidea. Aphidoidea, yep, I think that's how it's pronounced. Next we have aphid lion, two words. It's a noun from 1949. I wonder if this is similar to ant lion. Any of several insect larvae as a lacewing or ladybug larva that feed on aphids, called also aphis lion. I don't remember what the definition for ant lion said, uh, but they're both insects of some kind, so I'm just going to say they're related. And next we have aphis, A-P-H-I-S. This is a noun from 1763, any of a genus of aphids, broadly the synonym aphid. Next we have aphonia, A-P-H-O-N-I-A. It's a noun from 1654, loss of voice and of all but whispered speech. A phonic is an adjective. So when somebody says they've lost their voice, you can say that they have aphonia. This is from the Greek aphonos, which means voiceless, from a plus phone, which means sound, and there's more at the word ban, B-A-N. Yep, don't know how that got in there. Next we have aphorism. A-P-H-O-R-I-S-M. It's a noun from 1528. 1. A concise statement of a principle. 2. A terse formulation of a truth or sentiment. Synonym is adage, A-D-A-G-E. 
Aphorist is a noun. Aphoristic is an adjective. And aphoristically is an adverb. Next, we have aphorize. Similar to the last word, but it's R-I-Z-E at the end. This is an intransitive verb from 1669. To write or speak in or as if in aphorisms. Next, we have aphotic. A-P-H-O-T-I-C. This is an adjective from 1894. Being the deep zone of an ocean or lake receiving too little light to permit photosynthesis. So when a body of water is so deep that the light from the sun can't get in, um, any plants at the bottom are not going to receive photosynthesis, which means they will die, which means there probably aren't any plants at that level. Next we have aphrodisiac. A-P-H-R-O-D-I-S-I-A-C. This is a noun from 1711, an agent as a food or drug that arouses or is held to arouse sexual desire. I think there's a lot of misinformation about this word. Um, A lot of people say that certain foods or drugs uh, will arouse sexual desire. Oysters is one of those that I've heard. I don't know if there's any hard, fast science behind any of it, but, uh, but, you know, the word is still out there. Aphrodisiac and aphrodisiacal, that's not how you say that word. Aphrodisiacal is an adjective. This is from the Greek aphrodisiakos, which means sexual or gem with aphrodisiac properties. And that is from aphrodisia, which means heterosexual pleasures. And that is from the neutral plural of Aphrodisios, of Aphrodite. That's the name Aphrodite. And I believe Aphrodite was a Greek goddess. I should look that up to double check, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. And, oh, here we go. Aphrodite is the next word with a capital A. This is a noun from 1565, the Greek goddess of love and beauty. Compared to the word Venus, I think Venus might be the, is it the Roman name for Aphrodite? Something like that. I feel dumb. When I'm put on the spot, it's so hard to remember all these little details. Uh, But I think that famous painting um, of the woman coming out of the clam with the cherubs flying around her is of Aphrodite and or Venus. I hope I'm right. Side note. That painting was copied in a film, a Terry Gilliam film called The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. It's a very odd film, but I really love it. It did not do well in theaters when it came out in the 80s, uh, but I highly recommend it. And so there's a scene uh, where they sort of recreate that painting, and it's very well done. Next, we have Apiarian. I sort of uh, extra emphasize that one. Apiarian. A P I. A-R-I-A-N. This is an adjective from 1790, of or relating to beekeeping or bees. Next we have apiarist. It's kind of a weird word. Um, A-P-I-A-R-I-S-T. It's related to our last word. It's a noun from 1785, and it means beekeeper. Apiarist. I think that's uh, a better way to pronounce it. Next we have apiary. I wanted to say apiary, but that's not exactly how the pronunciation guide is telling me. But that uh, sounds right to me. This is a noun from 1654, a place where bees are kept, especially a collection of hives or colonies of bees kept for their honey. I don't remember if I saw it, um, but I'm curious how the API prefix uh, got connected to bees. I may have to look it up. Uh, I figured if it was in here, it, it would have been shown already. Um, but yeah, I, w- how, how, how are bees related to the API prefix? Uh, is that a, a Latin word, a Greek word? Uh, something I will have to look into. We will go ahead and do one more for this episode. It is apical, A-P-I-C-A-L. This is an adjective from 1806, one of relating to or situated at an apex. Two, of, relating to, or formed with the tip of the tongue, as in N, L, and R are apical consonants, because you form them with the tip of your tongue in your mouth. So N, uh, the tip of your tongue, hits the front of the roof of your mouth. L 
is formed with the tip of your tongue on your teeth. And R, uh, I guess you're sort of putting the tip of your tongue near the roof of your mouth, but it doesn't really touch anything, at least not the way I do it. But uh, that's interesting. Uh, and apically is an adverb. There were a lot of good words in this episode. I am going to go ahead and pick aphasia as the word of the episode because it is a loss or impairment of the power to use or comprehend words, usually resulting from brain damage. That is a word that uh, is very bad specifically in relation to this podcast. So again, apologies if you have that, but if you do have it, you're probably not listening to this podcast or any podcast for that matter. Uh, And that is going to be the end of the episode. We finished page 57. Next, we will start with page 58. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds, and welcome to a very special episode of The Dictionary. Today, I have a special guest reader, and it's been a while since I've had one. This guest reader is my wife, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Spencer. Nice to meet you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Good to meet you. That reminds me of, uh, uh, and, and how did this get made? Uh, two of the co-hosts are Paul and June, and they're married, but every time they he introduces her, they have a very cordial, hi, Paul, how are you? I'm good, June, how are you? <laughs> it's pretty funny. They the People joke uh, about that a lot. Anyway, we are going to read some words. We are at the top of page 58. Are you ready? I'm ready. Go. The first word is apical dominance. It is a noun from 1947, which means inhibition of the growth of lateral buds by the terminal bud of a shoot. Fascinating. (laughs) (sighs) The next word is (laughs) apical meristem, which is a noun originating from 1934, a meristem at the apex of a root or shoot that is responsible for increase in length. I don't know what a meristem is, but... There you go. I think it's a stem that takes Viagra. (laughs) The next word is apiculate, which is an adjective from 1830, which means ending abruptly in a small distinct point. An example is an apiculate leaf. Next we have apiculture, which is a noun from 1864, and means the keeping of bees, especially on a large scale. And the adjective of apiculture would be apicultural, and another noun, uh, the person who would be responsible for apiculture would be an apiculturist. Next we have a piece, which is an adverb from the 15th century, meaning for each one. A synonym would be individually. Next word is apis, capital A P I S, which is a noun from the 14th century, meaning a sacred bull worshipped by the ancient Egyptians. Next we have apish, which is an adjective originating around 1527, meaning resembling an ape, kind of like Spencer now <laughs> with how long his hair is. <laughs> um as a an extremely silly or affected example apish antics or b given to slavish imitation and apishly would be the adverb form of the word next we have apl all caps a p l which is a noun from 1966 meaning a computer programming language designed especially for the concise representation of algorithms. And I'm not a tech person at all, so I actually didn't know that APL stood for a programming language. I'm just very familiar with the acronym and not the actual uh, meaning of the acronym. Yeah, I don't even know what APL is, but yeah, it literally says that it gets the letters from A, programming and language. So that's kind of interesting. Next, we have a word I've never heard before. Aplanatic, spelled A-P-L-A-N-A-T-I-C, is an adjective from 1794, and it means free from or corrected for spherical aberration. An example, an aplanatic lens. Yeah, so it looks like this is for optics and the way lenses are built and uh, 
carved. Uh, that's probably not the right word, but you know, like a lens in like a, maybe an observatory lens or a camera lens or something uh, gets rid of spherical aberration. Hmm. I've never heard of this term before. I wonder if my friend who's an optometrist would know what this means. Yeah, maybe. Um, can I just ask, how do they know the approximate year or the exact year that these words were they're smart. <laughs> Honestly, I, I think it's really just like the first known usage of it. So it could have been from before that, but they know that it was used in ni- in 1794 in some maybe written thing. Um, and that's, that's the first known usage. That's as far as I understand it, at least. Oh, thank you. So it looks like this is adding the letter A plus the Greek word, aplanisthi, which means to wander, and we can find more about this uh, if we flip pages to the word planet. Which we're not going to do right now. All right, so next word is something that, um, as a nurse, I'm actually familiar with this. So it is aplastic anemia, which is a noun from 1928. It is an anemia that is characterized by defective function of the blood-forming organs, as in bone marrow, and is caused by toxic agents, as chemicals or x-rays, or is idiopathic in origin. I'm glad you understand that, because I don't. I'll educate you later. Thanks. Next, we have a plenty. And this is the first form. You can see by that little superscript one, this is the first form of two. Usually what that means is that one of them is a noun, and one of them is an adjective or a verb, or something like that. So we'll start with the first form. So the first form is an adjective from 1830, meaning being in plenty or abundance, used post positively. An example, money a plenty for all their needs. Don't we all wish we had money a plenty? Money a plenty for everyone. Woo woo. The second form of the word a plenty is an adverb from 1846. The first definition would mean in abundance. A synonym would be plentifully. And the second definition would be very much. A synonym would be extremely, as in scared a plenty, which during Halloween season, because <laughs> I'm a Halloween nerd, I love to scare Spencer a plenty. <laughs> and you love to be scared because you love to watch horror movies. So maybe we should uh, use this word. I've been scared a plenty. <laughs> The next word is a plate, which is a noun originating from 1879, which means a fine-grained, light-colored granite consisting almost entirely of quartz and feldspar? Yeah, it's a rock term. Oh, I don't really hear people asking for, uh, you know, I watch a lot of HGTV. You never hear anyone being like, oh, this is a feldspar countertop? (laughs) Fancy. Woo. All right, so where were we? An adjective of the word, a plight, would be a plitic. Uh, so there is some etymology for this word, aplite. Uh, it says it's probably from the German applet, which is from the Greek haplous, H-A-P-L-O-O-S, which means simple, and there's more at the prefix H-A-P-L. I don't know what that means, but we will move on. Next we have a plum. Not to be confused with a plum, which is a fruit. And you stick your thumb in a plum, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> it's that old, uh, what was that, that P- Peter Pumpkin? No, that's the wrong one. Peter Pumpkin Eater? Not that one, not that one. The Stuck one... his thumb in a plum? Yeah, there was a, there's that old fairy tale, not a fairy tale. I have no idea what you don't fairy know what tales this is. your parents read you. But... <laughs> You've never heard the one where the kid sticks his thumb in a plum? It's All right, we'll, we'll look it's it up. It's been a we'll long time, up. and we don't and have we're kids, old. and we're we're so old. We're nearing our forties. So this one is A P L O M B. That's how it's spelled. And it is a noun originating from 1823, and it means complete and confident, composure or self assurance. A synonym would be poise. Hmm. And actually, it looks like. The synonym for that definition is poise, and then there's a synonym for, well, it's really just one definition. Another synonym is confidence. Hmm, interesting. 
And the etymology for this one says uh, that it is a French word. It literally means perpendicularity. Um, and it is from the French a plum, uh, two separate words, which literally means according to the plummet, P-L-U-M-M-E-T. And being a nurse and science nerd that I am, I'm also familiar with the next word, which is apnea. And this is a noun originating from 1719. The first definition is transient cessation of respiration, especially sleep apnea. The second definition is asphyxia, and the adjective form of the word apnea is apneic. And the next word is actually a British variation of the word apnea. Uh, the definition I just read to you is spelled A-P-N-E-A, and this is spelled A-P-N-O-E-A. I believe it's just pronounced the same, apnea, but it's the British variation. I didn't know that. Yeah, we get that a lot. There's a lot of, like, sometimes they'll add O's or they'll add uh, other vowels or things. But, this, yeah, this comes up pretty often. The next word is apo, A-P-O, which is a noun. The plural form is apos, A-P-O-S. It originates from 1983, and the synonym is apolipoprotein, and it's usually used with a letter or a letter and number. So... From your nursing scientific background, do you know what an apolipoprotein is or what the letter and number? I wouldn't know. I've heard of it. I could not tell you off the top of my head because basically, um, yeah, as a nurse, they basically make you uh, memorize the amount of information a doctor would need to know (laughs) in a very short amount of time. And depending on what your actual job is, if you don't use those terms every day, it's familiar, but you're not going to be able to remember the exact right. definition. Or And it's not something you use every day. Definitely not. No, not not in my job. So, Well, we will get to that word apolipoprotein in the near future, probably. And next we have an abbreviation, APO, all caps, which stands for Army Post Office. Next, we have the prefix APO, A-P-O, or just A-P, one, away from or off. An example, aphelion, spelled A-P-H-E-L-I-O-N. Two, meaning detached or separate. An example, apogamy, A-P-O, G-A-M-Y, and three, formed from or related to. An example, apomorphine, A-P-O, morphine, like that drug, and also the band. Yeah, if you don't know the band Morphine, you should listen to them. They're cool. They're amazing. Spencer introduced me to them, and now they're one of my favorite bands. Yay. All right, and so finally, we have... APOC, capital A, P O C. It's an abbreviation for one, the apocalypse, two, apocrypha, spelled A P O C R Y P H A, and three, apocryphal, A P O C R Y P H A L. And since this is abbreviation for the end of the world, I think this is a good place to say this is the end of my episode. (laughs) It is the end of your episode, although I do want you to pick a word of the episode. So of all the words that you read, which do you pick to be your favorite? And you can use whatever criteria you want. Hmm. So I think I'm going to do a plum just because I think it sounds kind of elegant and... Uh, I didn't realize that it meant poise or confidence, and I think it would be kind of a fun word to use now and substitute it for either poise or confidence. Uh, Not that I use the word poise a lot, but (laughs) Um, maybe confidence. Yeah, so I'm going to go with that one. There have been a number of words that I've come across that I say to myself, or I say out loud, I should use this word in my everyday language. And of course, I immediately forget it. Well, you don't want people to think that you're like better than them. So 
Uh, no, I don't want to sound too fancy because the truth is I'm not. <laughs> that. It's true. (laughs) All right. Well, that will end the episode. Uh, Thank you very much for everybody listening. Thank you to Sharon for recording an episode. Uh, You might see her again in the future. You might not. We'll find out. And uh, until next time, this is Spencer and Sharon reading the dictionary. Thanks for getting creepy with us. (laughs) So for the regular listener of my podcast, uh, you were probably confused as to why Sharon said thanks for getting creepy with us. Uh, The reason she said that is because that is the way that she signs off on her podcast, which is called Whores Talk Horror. And of course, uh, we have to say they're not really whores. They just like wordplay. So it's her and her friend Mindy. Uh, They have a podcast where they talk about horror movies and true crime and uh, the paranormal and other creepy things. So if you are interested in any of those, please go check out their podcast, Whores Talk Horror, and I can put a link in in uh, the episode description. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Sharon, my wife. My (laughs) wife. (laughs) You're welcome. This was fun. Cool. I hope to uh, have you back. We'll see. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. It's not, uh, our podcasts are kind of opposite. Very opposite, but I totally respect um, this podcast, and I think it's very interesting. So I'm I'm glad you're doing it, and yeah. I'll convince you to do one more in the future. All right, that is the end of the episode. Thank you very much, and goodbye. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to a brand new episode of The Dictionary. I don't know why I keep saying that, because everyone is brand new, and there's a new one every single day. If you remember the end of the last episode, which was graciously co-hosted, co-read, by my wife, Sharon. Uh, The last word was an abbreviation for apocalypse. That was one of the three possible abbreviations. Uh, And so our first word for this episode is apocalypse. A-P-O-C-A-L-Y-P-S-E. This is a noun from the 13th century. 1A. One of the Jewish and Christian writings of the 200 BC to AD 150 marked by pseudonymity, symbolic imagery, and the expectation of an imminent cosmic cataclysm in which God destroys the ruling powers of evil and raises the righteous to life in a messianic kingdom. I was mentally not prepared for a definition of that length, I hope I got everything correctly. I'm not going to do a take two. Let's move on to 1B. Uh, In this form, it is capitalized, and it is the three definition for the word revelation. 2A, something viewed as a prophetic revelation. 2B, we have the synonym Armageddon. 3, a great disaster, as in an environmental apocalypse. I am now going to read some etymology to you, although I am going to pare it down a lot. Uh, This is from the Anglo-French apocalypse with an L-I-P. Let's see, this is from the Greek apocalyptine, which means to uncover, uh, and that is from acaliptine, which means to cover, and there's more at the word hell, H-E-L-L, or H-E double hockey stick, if we're keeping it clean. Although hell is not a dirty word. Not in my book. All right, next we have apocalyptic. Also apocalyptical. This is an adjective from 1663. One, of relating to or resembling an apocalypse. Two, forecasting the ultimate destiny of the world. Synonym is prophetic. Three, foreboding imminent disaster or final doom. Synonym is terrible. Four, Widely unrestrained, synonym is grandiose. Five, ultimately decisive, synonym is climactic, as in an apocalyptic battle. Apocalyptically is an adverb. Now we have apocalypticism, Ooh. or apocalyptism. That is a weird word to say because the, the emphasis on the syllables at the end gets real funky apocalyptism. Uh, It is a noun from 1884. Apocalyptic expectation, especially a doctrine concerning an imminent end of the world 
and an ensuing general resurrection and final judgment. Next we have Apocalyptist. This is a noun from 1835, the writer of an apocalypse. Next we have Apochromatic. This is an adjective from 1886, free from chromatic and spherical aberration, as in an apochromatic lens. Next we have apocope. This is a weird one. A-P-O-C-O-P-E. It's uh, not quite a palindrome, but it is very close to a palindrome. It is a noun from circa 1550, the loss of one or more sounds or letters at the end of a word, as in sing, from Old English, sing on. All right, so there is a little to unpack here. Uh, So we're familiar with the word sing. I hope we're all familiar with that. Uh, But I was not familiar that there was an old English word, singan, S-I-N-G-A-N. So they lost the A-N, and it's it's an apocope, I guess. The word sing is an apocope. And the etymology says this is Latin from the Greek apocope with a horizontal line over the E. Literally means cutting off. And that is from apocoptine, which means to cut off from coptin, which means to cut, and there's more at the word capon, C-A-P-O-N. Next we have apocrine, could also be apocrine or apocrine. It is spelled A-P-O-C-R-I-N-E. It's an adjective from 1926, producing a fluid secretion by pinching off one end of the secretory cell while leaving the rest intact, as in an apocrine gland also produced by an apocrine gland. That's a a sort of addendum to the definition. This is from the Greek apo plus crinine, which means to separate, and there's more at the word certain. Next we have apocrypha, A-P-O-C-R-Y-P-H-A. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, writings or statements of dubious authenticity. The two definitions, uh, A and B, are capitalized. So here's 2A. Books included in the Septuagint and Vulgate, but excluded from the Jewish and Protestant canons of the Old Testament. And then it tells me to see the Bible table. Uh, I do not know what Septuagint and Vulgate mean, and I also don't know if I pronounce them correctly. Septuagint is spelled capital S-E-P-T-U-A-G-I-N-T. And Vulgate is V-U-L-G-A-T-E. Here we go with 2B. Early Christian writings not included in the New Testament. The etymology says this is a Latin. It's the neutral form of apocryphus, which means secret or not canonical. And that is from the Greek apocryphos, which means obscure. That is from apocryptine, which means to hide away from cryptine, which means to hide, and there's more at the word crypt. Now we have apocryphal. We've added an L to the last word. It's an adjective from 1590, one of doubtful authenticity. Synonym is spurious, S-P-U-R-I-O-U-S. Two is often capitalized, of or resembling the apocrypha. And then we have a synonym for both definitions. It is the word fictitious. I've heard this word apocrypha and apocryphal. Uh, I don't know if I ever was super conscious of what it meant. I hope I remember that it basically means fictitious, uh, but we will see if I remember that. Apocryphally is an adverb, and apocryphalness is a noun. Next we have apodictic, A-P-O-D-I-C-T-I-C. Also, apodictic, Uh, and that one is spelled A-P-O-D-E-I-C-T-I-C. This is an adjective from circa 1645, expressing or of the nature of necessary truth or absolute certainty. Apodictically is a, wow, what strange word, Uh, but it is also an adverb. The etymology says this is from the Greek apodictikos, uh, or apodictini, something like that, which means to demonstrate, 
And that is from uh, Dick Deny, which means to show. And there's more at the word diction. Next, we have apodosis. A-P-O-D-O-S-I-S. I hope I pronounced it correctly for all you word nerds. But let me know if I didn't. Uh, this is a noun from 1604. The main clause of a conditional sentence compared to the word protasis. This is from the Greek apodidonai, which means to give back or deliver. And that is from didonai, which means to give. And there's more at the word date, D-A-T-E. Next, we have apoenzyme. This is a noun from 1936, a protein that forms an active enzyme system by combination with a coenzyme and determines the specificity of this system for a substrate. Next, we have apogamy, A-P-O-G-A-M-Y. This is a noun from circa 1878, development of a sporophyte from a gametophyte without fertilization. Some of you may think that I made up those words, but I did not. Uh, Sporophyte is S-P-O-R-O-P-H-Y-T-E, and gametophyte is G-A-M-E-T-O-P-H-Y-T-E. Next and last word for this episode is apogee, A-P-O-G-E-E. This is a noun from 1594. 1. The point in the orbit of an object as a satellite orbiting the Earth that is at the greatest distance from the center of the Earth. Also, the point farthest from a planet or a satellite as the moon reached by an object orbiting it. Compare to the word perigree. Uh, 2. The farthest or highest point. Synonym is culmination. As in, Aegean civilization reached its apogee in Crete. Apogean is an adjective. This is from the Greek uh, apogaion, which is the neutral of apogeos, or apogaios, which means far from the earth, and that is from apo plus gi, or gaia, which means earth. And we have a black and white picture describing the uh, number one definition of apogee. It shows the earth, and then there is a dotted line going around the earth to show the orbit of uh, what is, in this case, a black dot. Uh, But we could just say it's a satellite. And then uh, there's an arrow pointing to the black dot, and it is very obviously the furthest point away from the earth. So that is apogee. That will end this episode. I need to pick one. It's been a while since I've done this, so ooh, I need a second. I am going to pick the word apocalypticism because uh, it's a fun, long word to say. Not very creative, I know. Sorry about that. But until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. I don't have anything special to say, so let's get to the words. And the first one is apolipoprotein, A-P-O-L-I-P-O-P-R-O-T-E-I-N. And if you were to remember two episodes ago, uh, Sharon had the abbreviation for this word. Technically, it wasn't an abbreviation. Um, It was just a shorter form of it. Let me see. I think it was just apo, right? Yep, it was just apo. Synonym was apolipoprotein, and now we are going to get the definition. It is a noun from 1970, a protein that combines with a lipid to form a lipoprotein, often used with a letter or letter and number. Next, we have apolitical. It's the word political with the letter a. It's an adjective from 1935. One, having no interest or involvement in political affairs. Also, having an aversion to politics or political affairs. Two, having no political significance. Apolitically is an adverb, and apoliticism is a noun. So you won't hear this because I will have edited it out, uh, but I just let out a big burp. Somebody mentioned to me that I should just keep all those in and not cut them out. I don't know how I feel about that, Uh, I like humor. I like being transparent with you. I like being funny and goofy and showing you that I'm 
real and I make mistakes and I do stupid things, clearly I'm obviously reading the dictionary. Uh, so if you have any strong opinions about this, please send me a message or an email. Um, I know it's a weird thing to ask. Should I leave my burps in? Should I take my burps out? Uh, yeah, for now, I'm just going to leave them out. But boy, do I have a lot of burps saved in a, uh, a bloopers sequence, which maybe you will hear someday. All right, let's move on. Let's not talk about burps anymore. Uh, next, we have Apollinian, capital A-P-O-L-L-I-N-I-A-N. It's an adjective from 1924, and we have the synonym Apollinian. I think it is the exact same word, but it is spelled uh, A-P-O-L-L-O, so like the word Apollo, with N-I-A-N at the end. And Apollo is our next word. This is a noun from the 13th century. One, the Greek and Roman god of sunlight, prophecy, music, and poetry. A lot of good stuff in my book. Two, uh, we are talking about an asteroid, it tells me. Any of a class of asteroids having an orbit that extends from inside to beyond the Earth's orbit. And there's a part in brackets before that definition uh, that I think is telling me that there is an asteroid called Apollo. But I'm not getting a ton of information. All right, next we have Apollonian. Ah, that's how you pronounce that word. So this is the one that was the uh, synonym to Apollinian. This is an adjective from 1663, one, of relating to or resembling the god Apollo. Two, harmonious, measured, order, or balanced in character. Compare to the word Dionysian. And I think that is a word from the Greek god Dionysus. Is that his name? I think it is. Is Dionysus might be the one that's the god of wine. I'm not sure if I'm remembering that correctly, uh, but we'll find out when we get to the D's. Next, we have Apollyon. I think that's how it's pronounced. Capital A-P-O-L-L-Y-O-N. This is a noun from the 14th century. The angel of the bottomless pit in the book of Revelation. Next, we have apologetic. The first form, it is a noun from the 15th century, and we just have the one definition for the word apologetics with an S at the end. We will get to that shortly, don't worry. But now we have the second form of apologetic, it's an adjective, from 1649, 1A, offered in defense or vindication, as in the apologetic writings of the early Christians, 1B offered by way of excuse or apology, as in an apologetic smile. Two, regretfully acknowledging fault or failure. Synonym is contrite, C-O-N-T-R-I-T-E, as in replied in an apologetic tone. Apologetically is an adverb. Now we have that word apologetics. This is a noun from circa 1733. One, systematic argumentative discourse in defense as of a doctrine. Two, a branch of theology devoted to the defense of the divine origin and authority of Christianity. Next, we have apologia. And uh, yeah, let's say this will be the last word for the episode. It is spelled A-P-O-L-O-G-I-A. It's a noun from 1784. A defense especially of one's opinions, position, or actions. As in, the finest apologia or explanation of what drives a man to devote his life to pure mathematics. And that is from the British Book News. I don't know if it's a newspaper or a magazine or a book, but we do know it's British. Uh, and then we have a synonym. It's the word apology. So the word that I am picking for this episode is apolitical. I don't necessarily identify as someone who is apolitical, um, but I've never really paid a lot of attention to politics. Um, a lot of it just kind of goes over my head. But I will say the ideas behind it, uh, what politics do, the things that people talk about, I do feel pretty passionate about those things. It's more of the uh, the details of, of the world of politics and kind of understanding what everybody is saying. That's what goes over my head. Um, but in general, 
uh, I feel very strongly that there need to be some changes. Uh, for instance, things that I've said before, uh, more inclusivity for all people, uh, more more changes to how we deal with the environment. Um, you know, I'm very liberal in that sense. Uh, those are the things that I feel passionately about. Um, really, a lot of social justice with humans, animals, the planet, health. I'm not even going to get into it. I think I've done enough of that. Uh, So that's the word of the episode, and this is the end. Thank you very much for listening. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to a new episode of the dictionary. We are still going at it. This is the end of page 58. First word is apologize. A-P-O-L-O-G-I-S-E. This is the British variation of the American English word apologize, which has a Z instead of an S. Next, we have apologist. This is a noun from 1640, one who speaks or writes in defense of someone or something. And here we have apologize with a Z. It's an intransitive verb from 1596, to make an apology. Apologizer is a noun. Next, we have apologue. A-P-O-L-O-G-U-E. This is a noun from circa 1555. An allegorical narrative usually intended to convey a moral. This is from the Greek apologos, which is from apo plus logos, which means speech or narrative. Now we have the word apology. This is kind of a big one. It's a noun from 1533, 1-A. A formal justification. Synonym is defense. 1b. We have the 2a definition for the word excuse. 2. An admission of error or discourtesy accompanied by an expression of regret, as in a public apology. 3. A poor substitute. Synonym is makeshift. We have some additional synonym information, but first let's look at the etymology. This is from the Middle French apologie, which is from the Latin apologia, which is from the Greek uh, apo plus logos, which means speech, and there's more at the word legend. So here we go with the synonym information. Apology, apologia, or apologia, I can't remember what it is. Uh, Excuse, plea, pretext, and alibi mean matter offered in explanation or defense. Apology usually applies to an expression of regret for a mistake or wrong with implied admission of guilt or fault and with or without reference to mitigating or extenuating circumstances, as in, said by way of apology that he would have met them if he could. Apologia implies not admission of guilt or regret but a desire to make clear the grounds for some course, belief, or position, as in, his speech was an apologia for his foreign policy. Apologia sounds like a foreign word to me. doesn't sound like something we would be saying in English. But we have uh, taken a lot of Spanish, French, German, etc. words uh, in English that we use regularly. Excuse implies an intent to avoid or remove blame or censure, as in, used illness as an excuse for missing the meeting. Plea, P-L-E-A, stresses argument or appeal for understanding or sympathy or mercy, as in her usual plea that she was nearsighted. Pretext suggests subterfuge and the offering of false reasons or motives in excuse or explanation, as in, used any pretext to get out of work. Alibi implies a desire to shift blame or evade punishment and imputes mere plausibility to the explanation, as in, his alibi failed to stand scrutiny. And that is it for the word apology. Now we have apolune, A-P-O-L-U-N-E. This is a noun from circa 1968. The point in the path of a body orbiting the moon that is farthest from the center of the moon, compare to perilune. So this is clearly similar to apogee, which we read, I think, at the end of two episodes ago. Uh, But 
In that case, it is about how far away it is from Earth. In this case, Apollon, it's how far away it is from the moon. And this is from Apo plus the Latin word Luna, L-U-N-A, which means moon. And there's more at the word lunar. Next, we have Apomict, A-P-O-M-I-C-T. This is a noun from circa 1938. One produced or reproducing by apomixis. I don't know what that is. Oh, it's our next word. But before we get there, apomictic is an adjective and apomictically is an adverb. And here we go with apomixis. This is a noun from 1913. Reproduction as apogamy or parthenogenesis involving specialized generative tissues but not dependent on fertilization. Next we have apomorphine. This is a noun from 1888. A crystalline or crystalline morphine derivative C17H17NO2 that is a dopamine agonist and is administered in the forms of its hydrochloride for its powerful emetic action. Next, we have aponeurosis. This is a noun from 1676. A broad, flat sheet of dense, fibrous, collagenous connective tissue that covers, invests, and forms the terminations and attachments of various muscles. Aponeurotic is an adjective. This is from the Greek aponeurosis, which is from aponeurosthai, which means to pass into a tendon. And that is from apo plus neuron, which means sinew. And there's more at the word nerve. So I don't know why, but I kind of find it interesting that the Greek word neuron, N-E-U-R-O-N, means in English sinew, S-I-N-E-U, which is, I don't know what the exact definition of sinew is, but from what I understand, if you were to describe somebody as sinewy, uh, they would have a lot of sort of muscle showing they wouldn't have a lot of body fat on them uh just sort of i don't muscular isn't really the right term for it but it's um i don't know you know it when you see it let's move on next we have apophysis a-p-o-p-h-a-s-i-s this is a noun from 1657 the raising of an issue by claiming not to mention it as in the quote we won't discuss his past crimes. So that, of course, is not an example of how this word is used because obviously apophysis wasn't in that. Um, But the quote is a description of uh, the definition. Sure. This is a Latin word. It means repudiation. It's from the Greek word, um, or maybe it is also Greek word, which means denial or negation. And that is from the Greek word apophani, which means to deny That is from phanai, which means to say, and there's more at the word ban, B-A-N. This next one is a little bit weird. It doesn't tell me how to pronounce it, uh, but I'm going to take a guess. It is spelled A-P-O-P-H-T-H-E-G-M. So I would guess that it is pronounced apophthem. Yeah, apophthem. Uh, And it is the chiefly British variation of the word Apothem, A-P-O-T-H-E-G-M. So it got rid of that F sound uh, made by the P-H. So I hope that I've pronounced that correctly to all you Brits listening. Next we have apophyllite or apophyllite, A-P-O-P-H-Y-L-L-I-T-E. It's a noun from 1810, a mineral composed of a hydrous silicate of potassium, calcium, and fluorine or fluorine one of those, that is related to the zeolites and is usually found in transparent square prisms or white or grayish masses. This is French. It is from apo plus the Greek philon, which means leaf, and there's more at the word blade. Next we have apophysis, A-P-O-P-H-Y-S-I-S. It's a noun from 1646, an expanded or projecting part especially of an organism. Apophysial is an adjective. This is from the Greek apo plus phain, which means to bring forth, and there's more at the word be, be. 
like I be reading the dictionary. All right, next and last word for this episode is apoplectic. A-P-O-P-L-E-C-T-I-C. It's an adjective from 1611. One, of, relating to, or causing stroke. Two, affected with, inclined to, or showing symptoms of stroke. Three, of a kind to cause or apparently cause stroke. As in, an apoplectic rage. You would have to be super, super pissed off to cause a stroke by being so angry with rage. Also, greatly excited or angered, as in, was apoplectic over the news. Apoplectically is an adverb. The word of the episode is going to be the word apology because I think this is something that people don't do enough. Uh, I don't think that they necessarily are accountable uh, for their actions or, or take the blame for their own actions and um, they don't really feel like apologizing. I don't know. I could be wrong. Maybe there's enough apology out there, but I'm kind of guessing that is not the case. Uh, so yeah, if you feel like you're one of these people, maybe you should apologize to somebody. Um, I apologize a lot because I screw up a lot. All right, that's the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. Contact info is in the episode description. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to a new episode of The Dictionary. It's been a little while since I've recorded, so let's see if I remember how to do this. First word is apoplexy. A-P-O-P-L-E-X-Y. This is a noun from the 15th century, and the entire definition is uh, just the number five definition for the word stroke. And the last word from the previous episode was apoplectic which is a really, really hard word to say, and that is also related to strokes. Uh, let's see. This is from the Greek uh, apoplesin, which means to cripple by a stroke. That is from plesin, which means to strike. Uh, interesting, stroke and strike. Uh, and there's more at the word plaint, P-L-A-I-N-T. So I guess according to the Greeks, um, they sort of said you were being uh, struck in the brain by something. And that's where we get the word stroke. I'm just uh, going off what I'm reading here, people. All right, next we have apoptosis. A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S. This is a noun from 1972. A genetically directed process of cell self-destruction that is marked by the fragmentation of nuclear DNA is activated either by the presence of a stimulus or removal of a suppressing agent or stimulus and is a normal physiological process eliminating DNA-damaged, superfluous, or unwanted cells, called also programmed cell death. And apoptotic is an adjective. These words that start with A-P-O-P-T are really, really hard for me to say. This is from the Greek apoptosis, which means um, a falling off. And that is from apopiptin. Jeez, three Ps. Uh, apopiptin, which means to fall off. And that is from piptin, which means to fall. And there's more at the word feather. Of course there is, because why not? Next we have aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A. This is a noun from circa 1550, one an expression of real or pretended doubt or uncertainty, especially for rhetorical effect. Two, a logical impasse or contradiction, especially a radical contradiction in the import of a text or theory that is seen in deconstruction as inevitable. I do not know what I just read. This is from the French aporie, which is from the Greek aporia, which means difficulty, or perplexity, and that is from aporos, which means impassable, that is from poros, which means passage, so poros is passage, and then adding an A to it makes it uh, not possible to pass, impassable, Uh, and there's more at the word fair, F-A-R-E, not the fair that has the merry-go-round and the funnel cakes. Whenever I hear the word impasse, I always, always think of the movie Princess Bride, Uh, so if you haven't seen it, go see it. Next, we have a port, 
A-P-O-R-T. It's an adverb from 1627, on or toward the left side of a ship, as in, put the helm hard a port. I think the way that you remember that is port has left... Nope. Port has four letters, and left has four letters. Port does not have left letters. It has four letters. Uh, And I don't remember what the other side is, the right side. It's something. Next we have apos, A-P-O-S, or apos. Uh, This is the plural of apo, A-P-O. Next we have aposematic. Man, there's a lot of words that I do not know. A-P-O-S-E-M-A-T-I-C. This is an adjective from 1890. Being conspicuous and serving to warn, as in aposematic coloration in butterflies. Butterflies really do have amazing coloration. Uh, I would have sort of thought that uh, maybe an octopus would um, have aposematic coloring, uh, but they can also change, so maybe that's not the, uh, the best word to describe them. Aposematically is an adverb. This is from apo plus the Greek uh, simat or sima, which means sign. Specifically to the butterfly example, I have seen butterflies that um, have colorations on their wings that look like eyes, eyes from uh, different creatures or whatever. Uh, And so this is a perfect example of aposematic. They look like they are something else that is to warn something that might eat them that they shouldn't eat them. Uh, because other insects and small animals don't have very big brains, so they're very dumb, and they don't understand that it's a butterfly and not the other creature that they think it might be. Uh, So yes, nature is incredibly clever. Next we have a word that has a lot of syllables. Let's see if I can say this. Aposiopesis. Aposiopesis. A-P-O-S-I-O-P-E-S-I-S. Aposiopesis. Six syllables. Uh, This is a noun from 1555. The leaving of a thought incomplete, usually by a sudden breaking off. Parentheses, as in the quote, his behavior was, pause, but I blush to mention that. So, this is interesting. So the definition is the leaving of a thought incomplete, usually by a sudden breaking off. So the thought was, his behavior was, but it was cut off. And then they said, but I blush to mention that. What was his behavior? What would make you blush? Uh, Aposiopedic is an adjective. This is from the Greek uh, aposiopan, which means to be fully silent. And that is from siopan, which means to be silent. So adding the uh, APO at the beginning makes it fully silent. And uh, that is from uh, COP, which means silence. Maybe next time I want somebody to be silent, I will say COP, although it's probably not pronounced that way. Next, we have a word that looks like it can be pronounced a couple of ways. Uh, First way is apospory. Second way is apospory. A-P-O-S-P-O-R-Y. This is a noun from 1884. Production of uh, gametophytes directly from diploid cells of the sporophytes without spore formation, as in certain ferns and mosses. Next is apostasy. Now I want some linguini or something. Uh, It is spelled A-P-O-S-T-A-S-Y. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, renunciation of a religious faith. Two, abandonment of a previous loyalty. Synonym is defection. This is from the Middle English apostasi, uh, which is from the Latin apostasia, uh, and that is from the Greek... It doesn't tell me the Greek word, so maybe it's also apostasia, uh, and it literally means revolt, and that is from... This is Greek, aphistasthai, jeez, uh, which means to revolt. That is from histasthai, which means to stand, and there's more at the word stand. So you are standing for what you believe in, and you are abandoning your previous loyalty. Next, we have apostate, A-P-O-S-T-A-T-E. It's a noun from the 14th century, one who commits apostasy, which is what we just talked about. So if you are standing up for your 
what you believe in and you're renouncing your religious faith or you're denouncing your previous loyalty, you are an apostate. Apostate is also an adjective. Next we have apostatize, A-P-O-S-T-A-T-I-S-E. It's the British variation of apostize with a Z, which is our next word. It's an intransitive verb from 1611, to commit apostasy. And we will do one more word for this episode. It is, oh, there's a couple of ways to pronounce this. Uh, it is a posterior, posterior, oh boy, a space, P-O-S-T-E-R-I-O-R-I. I think this is, it looks Italian to me. It says it's Latin. Uh, how do you say this word? A posteriori. Posteriori. No, I keep on adding an R. A posteriori. Enough of that. Close enough. It's an adjective from 1588. One, the synonym is inductive. Two, relating to or derived by reasoning from observed facts. Compare to a priori. A much simpler word to say, it's probably the opposite. And the same word a posteriori is an adverb. Uh, This is Latin. It literally means from the ladder. L-A-T-T-E-R. We're not climbing up to clean the gutters. The word of the episode is going to be apostasy. Uh, I just sort of like the idea of... um, Uh, abandoning your previous loyalty because I think when usually when somebody does that it's because um, they've sort of had a realization or they've uh, made a a, a very hard decision probably to stand up for what they believe in and uh, I think that's something that uh, you know if done for the right reasons uh, should be commended so that is the end of the episode thank you very much for listening until next time this is Spencer reading the dictionary Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. Welcome to the Dictionary. It's a little warm here in this uh, audio booth studio thing, so I'm, I'm getting a little warm, but I'm going to persevere and record three more episodes, including this one. Uh, but if you hear a drop, it might be sweat dripping from my forehead onto the microphone. By the way, today uh, should be September 23rd, 2019, And I believe this is the vernal equinox. No, that's spring. Autumnal equinox. Uh, This is the day that the uh, amount of day and amount of night in a 24-hour period is essentially exactly the same. So, yes, go enjoy as much sunlight as you can. Unless you like the night, then go enjoy that as much as you can. And you are about to get a lot more night over the next uh, three, six months, whatever. All right, first word for this episode is Apostle, A-P-O-S-T-L-E. That's the name of a movie that I've never seen before. This is a noun from before the 12th century. One, one sent on a mission as, 1A, one of an authoritative New Testament group sent out to preach the gospel and made up especially of Christ's 12 original disciples and Paul. Sorry, Paul, you are not a 12 original disciple. I don't know who they are. I don't know who Paul is. Could be Paul McCartney. That's the first one I think of. Moving on. 1B. The first prominent Christian missionary to a region or group. 2A. A person who initiates a great moral reform or who first advocates an important belief or system. 2B. An ardent supporter. Synonym is adherent. 3. The highest ecclesiastical official in some church organizations. Sure, I can say ecclesiastical, but I can't say a posteriori. Maybe I said it. 4. One of a Mormon administrative council of 12 men. Apostleship is a noun. That is a boat I don't want to go on. Uh, Let's see. This is from Latin apostulus or apostolus, which is from the Greek apostolos, which is from apostelin, which means to send away. And that is from stellin, which means to send. So in Greek, um, obviously because we're, we're in the words that start with APO, we've been seeing a lot of uh, Greek words that start with APO, um, and they show you both forms. Uh, so what, uh, 
when when they add the APO, the the definition changes. So in this case, uh, they add uh, APO to the word stelling, which means to send, and that makes it apostelling, which means to send away. Similar, slightly different. Another example from the previous episode, histasthai means to stand, and then when you add apo to it, it means to revolt. So I may need to either look back at the apo words or look online and see if I can find a, a, a better description for the apo prefix in Greek and see what it means. Um, you know, are there any rules to how the word gets changed? I don't know. But we are going to move on to the next word slash phrase. It is Apostles' Creed. Capital A, P-O-S-T-L-E-S. And then there's an apostrophe at the end of the S. Second word, capital C, R-E-E-D. This is a noun from 1602. A Christian statement of belief ascribed to the twelve apostles and used especially in public worship. Next we have apostolate. A-P-O-S-T-O-L-A-T-E. It's a noun from the 14th century. 1. The office or mission of an apostle. 2. An association of persons dedicated to the propagation of a religion or a doctrine. Next we have apostolic. This is an adjective from the 13th century. 1a. Of or relating to an apostle. 1b. Of relating to or conforming to the teachings of the New Testament apostles. 2a. Of or relating to a succession of spiritual authority from the apostles held as by Roman Catholics, Anglicans, and Eastern Orthodox to be perpetuated by successive ordinations of bishops and to be necessary for valid sacraments and orders. <sighs> to B, we have the synonym papal, P-A-P-A-L. Papal, uh, let's see, apostolicity is a noun. Next we have apostolic delegate. It's a noun from circa 1907. It's two words, by the way. An ecclesiastical representative of the Holy See to the Catholic hierarchy of another country. Holy See is two words, capital H-O-L-Y. Next word, capital S-E-E, like you see with your eyes. Next we have apostolic father. Two words, both words are capitalized. This is a noun from 1828, a church father of the first or second century A.D., so that dude is old. Next, we have a word that I am more familiar with. It is apostrophe, the first form. Uh, this is a noun from 1533. The addressing of a usually absent person or a usually personified thing rhetorically, as in Carlyle's O Liberty, what things are done in thy name, is an example of apostrophe. So, of course, this is not the apostrophe that I was thinking of. That's probably form number two. Uh, so let's look at this. A uh, lot to unpack. So in this example, uh, there is a quote. O oh, Liberty, what things are done in thy name? That's the quote. That quote is from Carlyle. And that quote is an example of apostrophe, which, to remind me and you, is the addressing of a usually absent person or a usually personified thing rhetorically. Apostrophic is an adjective. This is from the Greek apostrophe, which literally means act of turning away. And that is from apostrophin, which means to turn away. That is from strephin, which means to turn. Now we have apostrophe form number two. It's a noun from 1727. A mark, and then it shows the apostrophe, used to indicate the omission of letters or figures, the possessive case, or the plural of letters or figures. What do they mean by figures in this case? Numbers? They would have said numbers if they mean numbers. What other things use apostrophes that are not letters? Hmm, I should know this, but I can't think of anything. Apostrophic is an adjective. All right, let's look at the etymology. Uh, this is uh, similar, I guess, to the previous etymology for the other word, apostrophe, uh, but slightly different. 
Um, basically, this one is from the Greek apostrophos, which means turned away. And the previous one was from uh, the Greek apostrophe, well, a few different forms of that word, uh, which all sort of related to turning and turning away. Uh, so, how turning away is related to our apostrophe, um, I don't know. But here we go with apostrophize. It's the British variation of apostrophize with a Z, which is next, of course. It happens like that pretty much all the time. Uh, this is a verb from 1718. The transitive definition is to address by or in apostrophe. That's in relation to the first form. The intransitive definition is to make use of apostrophe. Next, we have apothecaries' measure. I added that extra S because apothecaries has an S at the end, and then it has, funny enough, an apostrophe to make it, I think, the plural possessive. Uh, this is a noun from circa 1900, a system of liquid units of measure used chiefly by pharmacists, called also apothecary measure. Ends in a Y, apothecary does. Do they still use things called apothecary's measure? I wonder. Uh, but next, we have apothecary's weight. It's a noun from 1765, a whole 135 years before the previous one. Why did it take so long for them to figure that out? Uh, this one is a system of weights used chiefly by pharmacists, called also apothecary weight, and it tells me to see the weight table. Next, we have apothecary. It's a noun from the 14th century. One, one who prepares and sells drugs or compounds for medicinal purposes. Two, we have the synonym pharmacy. This is from uh, the Middle Latin apothecarius, which means shopkeeper. Uh, that is from apotheca, which means storehouse. And that is from the Greek apothoki. That is from apotithenai, which means to put away. And that is from tithenai, which means to put. And there's more at the word do. So an apothecary was basically just a shopkeeper, I guess. Next, we have apothecium. A-P-O-T-H-E-C-I-U-M. It's a noun from 1830. A spore-bearing structure in many lichens and fungi consisting of a discoid or cupped body bearing ASCII on the exposed flat or concave surface. I don't know if I pronounced ASCII correctly. Uh, it is spelled A-S-C-I. Could just be ASCII. I don't know. Apothecial is an adjective. So this has to do with fungi, something I don't really know a lot about, but uh, I've been learning a little bit, uh, and it sounds like they are really, really fascinating. Like, incredibly so. Next, we have apothem, A-P-O-T-H-E-G-M. This is a noun from circa 1587, a short, pithy, and instructive saying or formulation. Synonym is aphorism, which we read uh, five, six, seven episodes ago, something like that. Uh, pithy, I like that word. It would be great if the dictionary gave me a description of an apothem. Uh, maybe I'll have to look one up. Uh, this is from the Greek apo, whoa, apophithinagasathai. I, uh, I butchered that kind of on purposely. It is spelled A-P-O-P-H-T-H-E-N-G-E-S-T-H-A-I. That is a funky word. Apophthingisthai. What that means, to speak out. And that is from Phthengisthai, which means to utter. Greek. That's a crazy language. Uh, let's see. Oh, I missed the adjective form. It is apothematic. Now we have the last word for this episode. It looks like it's pronounced the same way as the previous word, apothem, but it is spelled, well, more correctly in my mind, A-P-O-T-H-E-M. The previous one had a G before the M. Uh, let's see, this is a noun from circa 1856. The perpendicular from the center of a regular polygon 
to one of the sides. This is from the Greek thema, which means something laid down, or it also means theme. Either one, both make sense, I guess. Uh, something laid down. How that's related to the perpendicular from the center of a regular polygon to one of the sides, I'm not exactly sure. But those are all the words, and now I have to pick one. Um, well, I'm not going to pick any of the apostle words, just because I'm not. Um, let's go ahead and pick the first form of apostrophe. Um, I don't know. It seemed kind of interesting. I didn't totally understand it, but uh, yeah, that looks like a fun one. That's the end of the episode. Thank you for listening. Until next time, I'm reading you the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. We're back again. We are halfway done with page 59. Let's get to the first part of the second half. First word is apotheosis. A-P-O-T-H-E-O-S-I-S. This is a noun. From circa 1580, one, elevation to divine status. Synonym is deification. I'm waiting for somebody to do this to me. Two, the perfect example. Synonym is quintessence. As in, this is the literary apotheosis of the shaggy dog story. And that is from Thomas Satcliffe. Apotheosize is a transitive verb. This is from the Greek apotheosis, which is from apotheon, which means to deify, and that is from theos, which means God. Next we have apotropatic, A-P-O-T-R-O-P-A-I-C. I'm going to guess that this is from a Greek word uh, that has an A-P-O prefix, and that second part of it uh, means something different. This is an adjective from 1883, designed to avert evil, as in an apotropatic ritual. Apotropaically is an adverb. I think I said that correctly. Uh, all right, let's get to the etymology. This is from Greek, yep, I guessed, uh, apotrepine, which means to avert, and that is from trepine, which means to turn. Next, we have the first form of app, A-P-P. It's a noun from 1987. We have the 1A3 definition of the word application. Now we have the second form of app. It's an abbreviation for one, apparatus, two, appendix, three, appliance. And I'm going to throw in number four, appetizer. How is that not in there? All right, next we have Appalachian with a capital A. This is a noun from 1949, a native or resident of the Appalachian mountain area. I think some people also say uh, Appalachian. Next, we have Appalachian or Appalachian dulcimer. Uh, It's a noun from 1962, and we have the number two definition for the word dulcimer. Next, we have Appall, A-P-P-A-L-L. This is a verb from the 14th century. The intransitive definition, which I'm going to point out is coming first because usually it's the transitive definition that comes first, Uh, but this one is obsolete. Well, why did you put it first? Isn't it the more common usage comes first? I don't know. I'm making this up. Um, Anyway, the intransitive definition is obsolete and it has these synonyms weaken and fail. The transitive definition is to overcome with consternation, shock, or dismay, as in, we were appalled by his behavior. Oh, yes, we were. It was very appalling. Uh, And a synonym is the word dismay. This is from uh, Middle French, apalir, which is from the Old French, uh, looks like a plus palir, which means to grow pale. That is from the Latin uh, palascare. And then it says um, incho, I-N-C-H-O, period. Why, why is my brain not understanding what this means? Well, it says incho of palere, which means to be pale. And there's more at the word fallow. Uh, so palascare is the incho something of palere. Incho is short for something that's longer. I don't know what it is. 
Maybe it's because the word goes on two separate lines that that's confusing me, but what is incho short for? Let's move on. It's giving me a headache. Uh, Next word is appalling. It's an adjective from 1817. Inspiring horror, dismay, or disgust. As in, living under appalling conditions. Ooh, yeah, that's bad. Appallingly is an adverb. Next, we have Appaloosa with a capital A. It's a noun from 1947. Any of a breed of rugged saddle horses developed in Western North America and usually having a white or solid colored coat with small spots. The origin is unknown. Ooh, it's a mystery. There is a black and white picture of an Appaloosa horse. It is mid-run or mid canter or mid trot or mid gallop i don't know which one it is Uh, but it is mostly a solid color uh, until you get to its uh, back section how do we want to call that its rear quarters its butt its thighs i don't know anyway that part has some black spots next we have um, i think it's pronounced appanage or appanage Uh, a p p a n a g e You could also spell it with one P instead of two Ps. This is a noun from 1602. 1A, a grant, as of land or revenue, made by a sovereign or a legislative body to a dependent member of the royal family or a principal vassal. 1B, a property or privilege appropriated to or by a person as something due. D-U-E. And two, a rightful endowment or adjunct. This is from uh, French appanage, from Old French appanaire, which means to provide for a younger offspring. Huh? Uh, That is from the Middle Latin appanare, which is from the Latin ad plus panis, which means bread. And there's more at the word food. Next, we have apparat, A-P-P-A-R-A-T. It's a noun from 1941, and we have the number two definition for the word apparatus, which we will get to very shortly. Don't worry, keep your pants on. Uh, This is a Russian word, I guess, apparat. That's all it tells me. But maybe this will give us a little bit more information. It is apparatchik. So they took the first one and added C-H-I-K. This is a noun from 1941. One a member of a communist apparat. Two, a blindly devoted official, follower, or member of an organization as a corporation or political party, as in a movie studio apparatchik. So if you are an apparatchik and you are blindly devoted to, say, an organization, uh, and then you uh, see the light and you decide not to follow them anymore, uh, you could go do, you could be an apostate, and do apostasy, and uh, the, this is a callback to two episodes ago, uh, where you abandon a previous loyalty. Anyway, apparatchik is Russian, and it is from the word apparat, which is the word that we just read. And here we go with apparatus. If you will remember, apparat is the number two definition of apparatus. So pay close attention. So apparatus is a noun from circa 1628, a very, very good year. Uh, 1A, a set of materials or equipment designed for a particular use. 1B, a group of anatomical or cytological parts functioning together, as in mitotic apparatus. 1C, an instrument or appliance designed for a specific operation. Did you ever play Operation as a kid? I never really played it for real, but it was just fun to try and not get buzzed. And then it was fun when you got buzzed. Two, the functional process by means of which a systematized activity is carried out, as in the apparatus of society, as 2A, the machinery of government, 2B, the organization of a political party or an underground movement. So it looks like I probably should have left apparatus for the next episode, but we were all, you know, it was all related there, apparat, apparatchik, apparatus. Uh, So I went through, the next one might be a little short. 
I am going to pick apotheosis as the word of the episode, because why not? That is the end of the episode. I hope you're having as much fun listening to me reading the dictionary as I am reading you the dictionary. Uh, Until next time, which is the last quarter of page 59, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. First word is apparel. It's the first form. It is spelled A-P-P-A-R-E-L. This is a transitive verb from the 14th century. One, to put clothes on. Synonym is dress. Number two, the synonyms are adorn and embellish, as in accused of appareling the truth. I don't think I've ever heard it used that word that way. Whoa. All right, it looks like this is from the Anglo-French word that I am having a very, very hard time pronouncing. Apparailer. A-P-P-A-R-A-I-L-L-E-R. That means to prepare. And this is from the uh, VL, something Latin, uh, apariculare which is from the Latin apparare. Doesn't tell me what that means. Moving on to the second form of apparel. This is a noun from the 14th century. One, the equipment, as sails and rigging, of a ship. Two, personal attire. Synonym is clothing. Three, something that clothes or adorns, as in the bright apparel of spring. I guess you could say pollen is uh, an apparel of spring, but it is a pain in my nose, and it gets everywhere on my car and stuff. All right, next we have the word apparent. It's an adjective from the 14th century. One, open to view. Synonym is visible. Two, clear or manifest to the understanding, as in reasons that are readily apparent. Three, Appearing as actual to the eye or mind. 4. Having an indefeasible right to succeed to a title or estate. 5. Manifest to the senses or mind as real or true on the basis of evidence that may or may not be factually valid. As in, the air of spontaneity is perhaps more apparent than real. And that is from J.R. Sutherland. Apparentness is a noun. And here we have some synonym information. Apparent, illusory, seeming, ostensible, mean not actually being what appearance indicates. Apparent suggests appearance to unaided senses that may or may not be borne out by more rigorous examination or greater knowledge, as in the apparent cause of the accident. Illusory... I-L-L-U-S-O-R-Y, could also be pronounced other ways. Illusory implies a false impression based on deceptive resemblance or faulty observation, or influenced by emotions that prevent a clear view, as in an illusory sense of security. Seeming implies a character in the thing observed that gives it the appearance, sometimes through intent of something else, as in the seeming simplicity of the story. Ostensible suggests a discrepancy between an openly declared or naturally implied aim or reason and the true one, as in the ostensible reason for their visit. And in addition to all of that synonym information, there is another synonym at the end. It says, see the word evident. Next, we have apparently. It's an adverb from 1566. The definition says, it seems apparent, as in, the window had apparently been forced open. Ooh, if it was, you might want to check your house. There could be a burglar. Also, as in, apparently, we're supposed to wait here. You might want to check on that because I don't think that's true. All right, next, we have apparent magnitude. Two words. It's a noun. From 1785, the luminosity of a celestial body as a star, as observed from the Earth, compared to absolute magnitude. So when you observe a star from the Earth, 
Um, the apparent magnitude is whatever it looks like. Um, but I'm guessing absolute magnitude, ooh, which we must have read a long, long time ago, um, is what it, is the brightness that it actually is. Uh, so you can figure out how far away it is, and then you can, with math and numbers and things, uh, you can take the apparent magnitude and combine them, and you get the absolute magnitude. I'm smart. Next, we have apparent time. This is a noun from 1694. The time of day indicated by the hour angle of the sun or by a sundial. So if the angle of your shadow uh, is right below you, basically, there's no shadow, uh, the, the sun is straight above you. It is basically the middle of the day. Um, of course, that changes by where you are on the earth and the time of year. Uh, but if you have a really, really long shadow, that means the sun is really close to the horizon uh, on the east or the west, give or take. Uh, that means it's either early in the day or late in the day. Again, totally depends on where you are because in the north, in the summer, the sun just never sets and it goes around the horizon all day. And so it's not so easy to tell. Where were we? We just read apparent time. Next, we have apparition. This is a noun from the 15th century. 1A, an unusual or unexpected sight. Synonym is phenomenon. 1B, a ghostly figure. Ooh, I feel like I did that before. 2, the act of becoming visible. Synonym is appearance. Apparitional is an adjective. And I'm going to plug my wife's podcast again, Whores Talk Horror, uh, because they talk about ghost stories uh, fairly significantly. Um, and so there's a lot of apparition talk. It's very, very cool. Next, we have apparitor. A-P-P-A-R-I-T-O-R. Uh, this is a noun. Should I say a noun? I've been saying a noun, but it seems like I should say this is a noun. I don't know. From the 15th century, an official formerly sent to carry out the orders of a magistrate, judge, or court. Next, we have the first form of the word appeal, and this will be the last word for the episode. We are going to leave you on a cliffhanger so you won't get to hear what the second form of appeal is. Could there be a third form? I don't know. I haven't looked. It's a mystery to all of us. All right, so here we go with the first form of appeal. This is a noun from the 13th century. One, a legal proceeding by which a case is brought before a higher court for a review of the decision of a lower court. Two, a criminal accusation. Three, a, an application as to a recognized authority for corroboration, vindication, or decision. Three, b, an earnest plea. Synonym is entreaty, E-N-T-R-E-A-T-Y, as in an appeal for help. Help, help, I'm being repressed. I hope you get that joke. Most of you probably won't. 3C, an organized request for donations, as in the annual appeal. 4, the power of arousing a sympathetic response. Synonym is attraction, as in Movies had a great appeal for him. Movies have a great appeal for me. Uh, those last uh, couple of lines actually went on to page 60. Uh, so that is where we will begin the very next episode. I am going to pick apparent magnitude as the word of the episode because uh, I just think the stars and the universe are super, super fascinating to me. That's it. Thank you for listening. Go tell your friends, tell everybody no, tell your enemies, etc., etc. Until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Yeah, that phrase is getting a little old, uh, but maybe I'll think of something else later. The first word for this episode is the second form of appeal. A-P-P-E-A-L. The first form was at the end of the previous episode, and if you didn't go listen to that, what's wrong with you? Why are you listening to these out of order? Shame, shame on you. All right, this is a verb from the 14th century. 
The transitive definitions are 1. To charge with a crime. Synonym is accuse. 2. To take proceedings to have a lower court's decision reviewed in a higher court. Now we have the intransitive definitions. 1. To take a lower court's decision to a higher court for review. 2. To call upon another for corroboration, vindication, or decision. 3. To make an earnest request, as in, appealed to them for help. 4. To arouse a sympathetic response, as in, that idea appeals to him. For some reason, the idea for this podcast appealed to me, and now I am doing it, and it's ridiculous. Appealability is a noun. Appealable is an adjective. Are bananas appealable? And appealer is a noun. Now we have the word appealing. We've added an ing. It's an adjective from 1813. One, marked by earnest entreaty. Synonym is imploring. That starts with an im. Two, having appeal. Synonym is pleasing, as in an appealing design. English is weird. There are a lot of words that have at least two meanings. So just for instance, our last word, appeal, uh, when you're in court, you can appeal the decision. Um, But something can also be, in this case, appealing, uh, pleasing. Uh, it's It's a very confusing language. And I'm not surprised when people from other countries who speak other languages complain about how confusing it is. Um, I've heard that it's actually one of the hardest languages to learn. Uh, So I guess I'm grateful that I learned it from, you know, babyhood. Uh, But yeah, it's it's a really, really weird and confusing language. All right, just to finish up appealing, we have an adverb form, which is appealingly. Next, we have the word appear. It's an intransitive verb from the 13th century, 1a, to be or come in sight, as in, the sun appears on the horizon, 1b, to show up, as in, appears promptly at 8 each day, 2, to come formally before an authoritative body, as in, must appear in court today. Maybe they have to appear in court because they have an appeal. 3, to have an outward aspect. Synonym is seem, S-E-E-M, as in, appears happy enough. Four, to become evident or manifest, as in, there appears to be evidence to the contrary. Five, to come into public view, as in, first appeared on a television variety show. Also as in, the book appeared in print a few years ago. Six, to come into existence, as in, Hominids appeared late in the evolutionary train. Ooh, what's the evolutionary train? When you uh, start on it, you're you're where you are, and then when you get to your destination, you've evolved into a new creature. Ooh, that reminds me of this Super Nintendo game I had when I was a kid, and it was all about evolution, and you would add new features to your water creature, and then it would gradually get more and more advanced, and then you'd move to land, and ooh, that was a fun game. Anyway, uh, where did we leave off? Okay, so the example was hominids appeared late in the evolutionary chain, not train. So the definitions for this one are interesting because every single one had at least one example. Uh, One of them had two. I like it when they give examples because it helps you understand that definition a little bit more. Uh, But there's a lot that just don't give an example at all. I mean, if you look at... uh, appeal at the beginning of the episode, a few of those didn't have an example at all. And then you look at this one, and every single one has at least one example. Here's a little bit on the etymology for appear. It is from the Latin apparere, which is from ad plus parere, which means to show oneself. Next we have appearance. It's a noun from the 14th century. 1a, external show. Synonym is semblance. As in, although hostile, he preserved an appearance of neutrality. I gotta say that that kind of describes me pretty well. I kind of like being neutral. I don't like conflict. I like solving conflict. I like helping. 
Uh, when I was in junior high, I actually did a little bit of that uh, peer mediation thing. I don't know. I assume they're still doing it, but this was a while ago. Uh, and, and I really like doing that. But enough about me. How about you? No. Uh, 1B. Outward aspect. Synonym is look. L-O-O-K. As in, had a fierce appearance. 1C. This is plural, so appearances. Definition is outward indication. As in, trying to keep up appearances. 2A. A sense, impression, or aspect of a thing. As in, the blue of distant hills is only an appearance. That example seems like it should be uh, from a poem or something. It's, it's very uh, poetic and lyrical. All right, 2B. The world of sensible phenomena. 3A. The act, action, or process of appearing. 3B. The presentation of oneself in court as a party to an action, often through the representation of an attorney. 4A. Something that appears. Synonym is phenomenon. 4B. An instance of appearing. Synonym is occurrence. Next we have appease. A-P-P-E-A-S-E. It's a transitive verb from the 14th century. 1. To bring to a state of peace or quiet. Synonym is calm. 2. To cause to subside. Synonym is allay, A-L-L-A-Y, as in, appeased my hunger. 3. We have these synonyms pacify and conciliate. C-O-N-C-I-L-I-A-T-E. I think that's how it's pronounced. Especially to buy off an aggressor by concessions usually at the sacrifice of principles. So that was an add-on to the number three definition. And then for all definitions, we have a synonym, uh, which is the word pacify. Uh, appeasable is an adjective. Appeasement is a noun. And appeaser is also a noun. Next, we have the first form of appellant, A-P-P-E-L-L-A-N-T. And uh, the second form will be the last word for this episode. So the first form is an adjective. It's from the 14th century, of or relating to an appeal. And a synonym is appellate, A-P-P-E-L-L-A-T-E. And we will get to that word at the beginning of the next episode. But we do have an example for this one, an appellant court. Now we have the second form of appellant. It's a noun from the 15th century, one that appeals. Specifically, one that appeals from a judicial decision or decree. The word of the episode is going to be the word appear because it has a lot of different definitions and uh, I just find it interesting that we have so many words in the English language that can mean so many different things. That is the end. Thank you for breaching the end and thank you for listening. Information to contact me is in the episode descriptions. Please, please, please share it. Subscribe write a review on whatever platform you're on. It really does help. I hate to be the one who says that, but I'm saying it. And until next time, this is Spencer reading you the dictionary. Goodbye.